Does it work? <laughs> PewDiePie uh, is a video game YouTuber. Um, he's a guy, he, he plays video games and comments over them. He is currently the largest YouTuber in the world with over 50 million subscribers. Um, one of the things I touched on in the video is that uh, uh, PewDiePie has made a number of moves that, again, it's debatable whether that means he's actually like kind of a racist jerk or if he's just a guy who's made some mistakes, but he's brought some far-right figureheads onto his channel. He dropped the N-word in a video one time. He used Fiverr to pay some people in another country to hold up a sign that said death to all Jews, but claimed it was a joke. Um, so it's one of these things where like he's been getting edgier as time goes on and a lot of far-right people think, ah, PewDiePie is one of us. And similarly, they are using his platform to onboard people, but how, how much he's trying to be part of that is debatable. Um, you seem to uh, imply, or maybe I'm just inferring it, that the underlying technology of uh, the internet is uh, either making this possible or just making it really easy. Um, but Plato um, said that democracy always leads to authoritarianism. Uh, there's no internet there. So I, I guess what I'm asking you is, um, do, you, do you see this uh, phenomenon of the alt-right <clears throat> spreading now because of technology, or is it something else? Um. I'm going to repeat the question just for the camera. The uh, question was about whether technology is responsible for the alt-right or something else. Um, so one of the things I learned in researching is that like, there were all these hate movements throughout the 90s and uh, early 2000s, and there was a sudden drop in 2013 of how many people were part of patriot groups and how many people were part of hate groups. Um, and that's right around the time that like, social media took off. So it's not so much that it's creating a new type of authoritarianism, it's just uh, authoritarianism that already existed is now taking advantage of the internet because mainstream authoritarianism, like it, it gets kind of a bad rep, like beyond a certain point. One thing I learned from reading Nywert is um, there's like this cycle of a uh, hate group like gets a certain amount of cultural traction, is able to present itself as kind of like mainstream and oh, not that extreme. And then eventually they reveal their true colors like, uh, there was a patriot movement in the early, uh, the early 90s that ultimately culminated in one of them committing the Oklahoma City bombing. And at that point, like, their credibility is shot and, and everyone involved has to like, disassociate from the movement. What the internet has provided is a way of kind of subverting that cycle because it's so decentralized that even if they humiliate themselves or if they're culpable for something really awful, all of them have only had debatable involvement in the first place, and so they can just kind of rebrand and keep moving. So it's that technology has allowed things that anti-fascist movements are not quite prepared to fight yet. And part of my work has just been like, hey, how have, how have fascists adapted to the social media age, and how do we need to adapt in order to deal with them? But yeah, the, the song is very old. Hello. Be a member of the alt right. Remember when he said the people that were the anti Nazis who marched on the campus uh, and there was that spell of ball of height and that they were, they were fine people in that, etc. And just a, just a lot of things that he says or promoting violence or, or, or whatever, and uh, rallies and things like that. And I wonder what the roles. Person on Steve Band Band, is that his name? Banning it right on news. It, it seems like you know we're talking on a broad level to get more more people more as members, but somehow it seems as though I don't want to say conspiracy theory, <laughs> but uh, it seems as though somebody who's rude to act a certain way that's kind of in sync 
with kind of all right. And maybe, I don't know what you think about that, but it, this kind of thing bothers me. What, what is the question? Oh, what is the question? <laughs> Do you think that the current president was being groomed to be a member of the all right, either by Steve Bannon or other actors or whatever? Okay. Uh, it, it, is this behavior, do you see anything there? Yeah, so the question is, uh, is, is Donald he who must not be named, uh, <laughs> uh, is he being groomed to be a sort of alt-right figurehead by people like Steve Bannon? Um, I mean, again, that's sort of one of those, yes, but to what degree is it intentional, right? Like, uh, the alt-right likes to claim that they memed someone into the White House, right? They just kind of picked this guy and said, we're going to put him into the White House whether he knows that we're responsible for it or not. Um, I can, like, I know that Steve Bannon is aware of the alt-right, like, and he used to be one of, I think he used to run the website Alternative Right, um, and Breitbart News is, like, published the piece called, uh, I, th I think, The User's Guide to the Alt-Right, so he knows a lot about this stuff, um, and I'm sure him being Trump's campaign strategist is a major point of that. I don't know how much you know who uh, knows about anything. Um, I don't know how much he understands anything that he's doing, uh, which again is one of his greatest assets. The fact that you don't know how intentional any of the things he's doing is, that it kind of makes him perfect for the alt-right. Perfectly plausible, deniable, perfect plausible deniability because you can't really say like, is he smart enough to do any of this on purpose? Um, so yeah, like, I don't know the answer and that's what makes him the perfect alt-right president. What I'm seeing going on, in my opinion, is a repetition of history. What's going on now in this country and in a lot of the rest of the world is very, very similar to what happened in the 1930s in the run to Hitler and the Second World War, and for exactly the same reason. What happened was the Treaty of Versailles in 1918 imposed such enormous economic sanctions on the Germans, it essentially drilled them right into the ground. Under no circumstances do I in any way support or condone anything that Hitler did. But given the situation that those people found themselves in, it's my opinion that if it hadn't been Hitler, it would have been somebody else. The very same thing has been going on in this country. For the last 40 years, the standard of living of the average American has been going slowly but steadily down with no end in sight. And so it's exactly the right conditions to create somebody like a Donald Trump and the alt-right and all of that sort of thing. So to me, the real root problem here is the ever-increasing impoverization of everybody except the 1%. And I'm wondering what you think of that. Uh, so the question was, um, I guess, largely about like uh, whether low quality of life due to economic precarity and poverty um, directly leads to far-right radicalization. Um, I think Yes, but it's more complicated. Um, so, like, one thing that, you know, economic precarity can also lead to is leftism, right? Um, it can lead to a, a very radicalized working class that radicalizes in a completely different direction. And I think which way a population is likely to go is sometimes very hard to predict. Um, I think that the United States' history is one that makes a large chunk of the population more likely to radicalize along conservative lines. Like, we have a lot of racism in this country. We as a nation have never really dealt with the history of slavery or the genocide of Native Americans, the way that like Germany after World War II tried to deal with the, the Nazis. So there's a lot of cultural factors as well. Um, one point that I make in the, the earlier video is that, you know, often we reach for um, economic anxiety as an explanation for why people would vote for someone like you know who. Um, but like it's, I would say it's more accurate that 
economic anxiety is one of the things that radicalism is sold as a solution to. Like, oh, the reason you can't find a job is because there's all these immigrants, right? Now, you can also say the reason you can't find a job is because the 1% has hoarded a whole lot of wealth. Um, and so I do think it's important to look at cultural factors as to like, why are people more susceptible to one argument than the other? Um, so yes, like economy is part of it, but also I'm one of these people who thinks that if we fix the economy, racism is not going to go away, right? Uh, there, there's a lot of argument like no war but class war, you solve economic inequality and you solve all equality. And I'm like, well, class war, yes, but other war too. Um, there's, the culture war is a very important war that I think we ignore at our own peril. So yes, but also. So the question was about what do we do about the alt-right? Um, always sort of my like punchy fun answer is like when I know I'll tell you. Um, so part of the, the idea of the alt-right playbook was like I kind of started with what are they doing and the, it's kind of expanded to why are they doing it and in time I'm hoping to get to and what do we do about it. Um, I have a lot of leads. Uh, I gave another talk at uh, Indivisible, actually, uh, last year, last year, two years ago? What is time? Um, where I basically said, if I were making a video about what to do, this is what that video would be, but I don't know if that will still be my answer when I get to the end of the series. So there's a number of things, like um, if you're trying to change an individual's mind, right? Um, you've found someone who's got showing kind of a reactionary streak, a lot of my research has turned up some good advice. Like Bob Altemeyer pointed out that, well, you wanna find somebody that, uh, you, you find a point of connection with them, right? Like uh, there are people who work on projects from the other side of the aisle that we care about, like cleaning up a river or something, right? Um, that's something a conservative might also do even if they don't believe in environmentalism. And if you work with them on that, and you keep talking about how a progressive or a leftist or a liberal looks at the world outside the context of a debate. You're just talking about your own life and your own experience. Try to demystify what the left looks at, what the left looks like and how they look at the world. That can get you better traction than like trying to have an argument with someone because people very reflexively like lock their heels when they're debating with someone. But if you're just talking about yourself, like that can get through to people. Um, I feel a lot of the time like there are two different tacks here, which is changing the mind of an individual versus publicly debunking an argument. And I think we sometimes try to do those at the same time, and I think it's best that they be treated as two different tracks that involve different tactics. And changing a person's mind should be very private. Um, you need to have a lot of time and a lot of patience, whereas debunking an argument should be very public, and as much as possible, try not to include the person making the bad argument so that you're not platforming them, you're not treating this like, oh, this is a debate with two sides and maybe both sides have a point and I just happen to be tipping in one direction. Um, there's a debunking handbook online that you can look at. I think if you just Google debunking handbook, you can find it that gives advice for how to start with a very truth first argumentation strategy, which is like start with here's the way things actually are and then we will get to the misrepresentation as opposed to what we tend to default to, which is here's how people are misrepresenting things and now here's how they actually are. Um, so there's a bunch of bits and pieces like that, but I'm hoping to tie them together into something more cohesive by the end of the series. Okay, we're going to take two more questions. Um, so I'm really interested in the, in the technology aspect and the issues around morality and the possibilities for legal outcomes, um, specifically for platforms responsible for communication online. Um, so. I mean, I love Facebook, not because of, um, of its support for all right, although it's arguable that, that they've made quite a lot of money off of this movement. Um, I left it because it's a better argument machine than a tandem bike or a canoe. Um, yeah, so I guess my question for you is, what do you see in the future there? Because 
Um, you know, we know that we've been exposed through Cambridge um, Analytica to the Russians. Um, we know that our data is still out there and the possibility that hooks are still in Facebook um, is, is very real. Um, and the fact that people who had these personality traits were specifically targeted is known. Um, so my question is, if there is leadership around this, which I think there is, um, those people have the ability to very uh, intimately manipulate the way that people think about the world around them. And what do you predict for the future um, with the state of technology being what it is today? Uh, so the question was about um, how technology factors into radicalization and what my predictions for the future and dealing with that problem are. Um, I, I make it a policy not to prognosticate. Um, I don't know what's going to happen. I have some ideas about what needs to happen. Um, like they need to be regulated, like flatly, like social media platforms need to be better regulated. Um, and one of the biggest problems we have is right now the legal system really doesn't understand the internet. Like that's the thing I learned during Gamergate is how often people being harassed by online hate mobs would go to the cops and the cops would just be like, what's Twitter? <laughs> um, and so like legislators understanding that like, hey, look, sometimes you're not gonna know whether a person is actually harassing you or trying to talk in good faith and just particularly angry. And the point is you need to look at the consequences more than you look at uh, their intentions because intentions are always debatable when you're dealing with the alt-right. Um, regulation needs to happen. I don't know how it's going to happen and I don't entirely know what the best regulation even is, right? Like uh, it, it's a big complicated problem that I, I don't know how to fix Facebook, um, but yeah, like, People are going to have to get sanctioned. They're going to have to get real sanctions that are like, if you're publishing fake news, you can get penalized for that and at an amount of money that it doesn't just become a cost of doing business. Um, and I'm not even sure which of the politicians running now properly understand that. At one point in time, I would have actually said Kamala Harris, but I, I dislike her for too many other reasons. Um, but during Gamergate, I believe she was someone who actually kind of understood the importance of tech literacy in uh, the legal system. And I don't know in many other candidates who even understand the problem. One more. Uh, Ian, Hi. You, you, you had mentioned um, these young men who are uh, vulnerable to uh, being recruited uh, in, into the alt-right and that <clears throat> the, uh, the, uh, the fascist groups are, and the racist groups are deliberately, purposely trying to reach out to them for the purpose of recruiting. Is there something that are that progressives could be doing to reach out to the same population, not to try to sleazily recruit them into a movement or something, but to just reach them. Uh, so the question was about the population that the alt-right is targeting, should we be targeting them as well in some fashion? Uh, this is a thing I actually really go back and forth on. Like before I made this last video, my attitude was, was kind of like, fuck them. <laughs> uh, like, uh, to speak indelicately. Um, mainly because like, we already outnumber the right, right? Uh, by, you know, we won the last election by three million votes, um, but we didn't win the election because reasons. Um, and I feel like there are a lot of people whose voices are being suppressed. There's a lot of people who are already on our side, but they're, they're not getting the same influence. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the way that far right reactionaries know how to game systems. They know how to hijack algorithms. They know how to, um, game the Electoral College, like they know how to make the news talk about them and treat them in a very both sidesy way when they shouldn't really be given a platform at all. So my reflex has always been like, don't put your energy into reaching these guys where apparently all they needed was an angry guy in a Star Wars forum to turn into a fascist. Um, put your energy into all the people who are already on our side who aren't getting platformed and aren't getting elevated. Um, researching this video is the first time where I kind of started to soften on that, where I started to think like, the left does have kind of a, you gotta come to us attitude a lot of the time. And there's this huge population of people who are valuable to the right because up until recently they weren't politically engaged at all. Um, and the far right found that there is an anger to them that they know how to weaponize. Um, and so they've been activating all these people and, and that's dramatically changed politics. And I do sort of feel like, oh man, maybe if we hadn't written them off, we could have stemmed some of that. And maybe there's a lot of places where we could stem that still. Um, so I have been feeling a bit more like, 
maybe we do need to intervene. We need to find the places we think are ripe for recruitment and like get in there and try to prevent them from getting radicalized. I'm not sure what the best way to do that is. Um, it may, like one thing I said in the video is just talk to your mods like on these websites. It's really just maybe a question of just put your foot down now. Like make sure like, hey, this is a thing that's probably going to happen. Let's pass some policy that makes it harder to happen. Um, and you know, I try to talk about these things so that maybe if they're a bit more culturally understood, they're a bit harder to accomplish. But it's something I want to look into more because I do think so long as we don't overfocus on it, so long as we don't get so fixated on changing their minds that we stop doing that work to elevate the people on our side, um, I think they're both worth doing. Mm -hmm.